The FTC vs. Xbox court case has wrapped up. The last few days have had some serious bombshell reveals and confessions even, like Microsoft's CEO wishing that exclusives just weren't even a thing, Sony's poorly redacted documents revealing staggering numbers, and Modern Warfare 3's release date leaked by the judge, and a whole lot more. So if you guys like these news and informational videos, make sure to tap that like button. It's the best way to let me know you want to see some more content like this on the channel. So we had some of the biggest names in game I mean, take the stand, speaking under oath, nothing but truth, people like Activision's Bobby Kotick, Sony's Jim Ryan, Phil Spencer, and so many more. We covered the first two days in a previous video. I highly recommend watching that video for those details as well, but this video will focus on th days three, four, and five. The judge's verdict on this case is still unknown. They're still trying to figure that out, but once we do get that information, I'll share it with you guys here on the channel, though I think we all know what the answer is going to be. So make sure you stay tuned throughout the whole video to understand all the details. So on day three, PlayStation's Jim Ryan went to the stand and actually provided a lot of really great information. First, he admits that Starfield going Xbox exclusive is not anti-competitive, specifically saying, I don't like it, but I have fundamentally no quarrel with it. Coming from Sony's Jim Ryan about PlayStation, that totally makes sense, as PlayStation is kind of known for its exclusive games like God of War, The Last of Us, Spider-Man, and so many more. Funny thing is that when Starfield was in earlier development, Sony was thinking about buying that game to make it an exclusive for the PlayStation. That was until Xbox came in and just bought the whole company. Throughout the rest of Jim Ryan's statements, they really did show that whatever he's been saying publicly is not matching matching up exactly what he's saying when it comes to the court case here, where it sounds like the court case, he's like, yeah, I'm just kind of blowing this out of proportion. Jim Ryan does actually provide some feedback when it comes to Game Pass from Xbox and saying that it's not very good. And he has proof. Quoted here saying, I talked to all the publishers and they unanimously do not like Game Pass because it is value destructive. Continuing on saying, the Game Pass business model appears to have some challenges and Microsoft appears to be losing a lot of money on it. It does kind of make sense a little bit as we have seen Xbox come out saying that, yeah, sales that we have haven't really been as high as we would hope because a lot of people subscribe to Game Pass where you can just kind of download whatever game that's in there and you can just play it. I haven't really seen any details about how revenue share works when it comes to Game Pass, but we did see Xbox recently move their price up just slightly from a dollar. So previously it was $9.99 a month. Now it's $10.99 a month. This is pretty standard upcharging when it comes to services from Xbox. Seen this done all the time when it comes to Xbox Live. Whenever a price hike happens with Xbox Live, people complain about it and then you just kind of get used to it. And it does look like PlayStation has no intentions to copying the day and date feature when it comes to Xbox Game Pass, saying that they're not going to copy Game Pass's approach to exclusive despite the rise of $70 for a game because the current strategy is working. Personally, I am loving the Xbox Game Pass feature. It has me play games that I probably wouldn't even bother buying or trying out like Flight Simulator. I probably wouldn't buy that, but now I absolutely love that game. High on Life, I definitely would have not tried that game out, but since it's on Game Pass, I had a chance to play it. Now that you have some EA games thrown on there like Battlefield 2042, like, yeah, I'm going to jump in and play them. Like, it's cool that this is a really awesome feature with Xbox. I know a lot of people like it, and I can't really see them changing the model a whole lot besides hiking up the price just slowly. And if Xbox continues the day and date releases on Game Pass, well, you'll keep my subscription for sure. Some really awesome behind the scene details when it comes to the business side of some of these major games that we know about for PlayStation was revealed due to poor redactions by Sony. A lot of the documents had redacted elements right here, but they weren't really redacted that well. If you look hard enough, you can read what's underneath the black ink, which a lot of the crucial business details that you should try to keep hidden to a lot of people got released. Saying that The Last of Us Part Two cost $220 million to develop. And also Horizon Forbidden West, meanwhile, costing $212 million to develop with more than 300 developers. Oh, and more big bucks were revealed from PlayStation's poor redactions. How about the fact that Sony makes $800 million on Call of Duty alone? Some interesting demographics were also shown when it comes to PlayStation 5 users and the kind of products that they own. Showcase for here is saying that almost half of the US-based PlayStation 5 users own a Nintendo Switch 
while less than 20% of PlayStation 5 owners in the same country also own an Xbox Series X or S console. I think this guy continues to show why Nintendo continues to slay when it comes to game sales and platform sales because they do their own thing, right? Nintendo's like their own separate island that just slays and makes money like crazy, while Xbox and PlayStation are fighting over like that similar market share. While the two of them are relatively close with the Xbox being a solid third place and PlayStation just above them, but then you have Nintendo like way up there. Microsoft CEO Satya Nadella did state that if it was up to him, he'd get rid of exclusives completely within gaming. Continuing on saying, especially as a low share player in the console market, that the dominant player there has defined market competition using exclusives. And so that's the world we live in. I have no love for that world. Praised base Nadella. Imagine a gaming world without exclusives and everyone just kind of developed for everyone. And it was up to just like whoever wanted to play whatever game on whatever platform they wanted and let the best win. That sounds like a world I would like to live in when it comes to gaming, but sadly we're not in that because exclusive have just been a thing on consoles for the longest time. Like we said, with Nintendo, they slay because you can really only get Nintendo stuff on Nintendo. Yeah, there is some cross-platform stuff out there, but you really need to get Nintendo stuff if you want to play Nintendo type IPs, where you have Sony that tries to snag up bits and pieces of big name games that they, so you can't share it with Xbox and Xbox grabs big games so you can't share it with PlayStation and vice versa. I mean, heck, it wasn't until the last generation of consoles where crossplay was even a thing. I played multiple generations of consoles online where I was like, oh, I have Xbox, I can't play with you because because you have PlayStation. Glad to see those barriers are starting to be taken down because they've shown to obviously cause more profit. If doing this extra work wasn't profitable for these companies, well, they wouldn't be doing it in the first place. The biggest discussion we've seen about this entire acquisition by Xbox of Activision Blizzard is about Call of Duty and PlayStation freaking out about it. Call of Duty becoming an exclusive game to Xbox. And Bobby Kodak, the CEO of Activision, talks about this in his testimony. When the Activision CEO was asked if he ever thought thought of making Call of Duty exclusive to one platform, he said no. You would alienate over 100 million monthly active players. Half of them play on phones, while the rest of them play on computer and PlayStation. And you would have a revolt if you were to remove the game from one or more platforms very true. Continuing on saying it would be very detrimental to our business, which is absolutely key to know because that's ultimately what this is all about, making more money. If you have your game being platform exclusive, especially a game like Call of Duty, you're going to make less money if it's on less options for players to buy the game on. But like I said earlier, there isn't really that option on Nintendo, but Kodak is looking into it. Talking about if it would see Activision's games on the next console for Nintendo, he said he would consider it once he had the specs, but we don't have any present plans. As with Call of Duty, it has a certain visual fidelity that you mainly want to keep. We did see that Call of Duty did go to the Wii back in the day, which the Wii versions of Call of Duty were just like complete jokes. And when it comes to game development, a lot of times you have to make your game around the lowest common denominator. We saw with the scarcity of the new consoles, that's why the last gen consoles have stuck around so long is because it was difficult to find like an Xbox Series X, a PlayStation which held back a lot of games and honestly probably caused a lot of development issues for a lot of games because they had to make sure they ran on this 10 year old hardware as well as looking amazing on the new stuff. But we're just starting to see games now made just for the current gen consoles. We're slowly getting out of that last gen. And from my experience, this is one of the longest transitions we've had out of last gen, again, due to the pandemic and shortage on supply. Rolling into the final day, day five, it actually had some aspects revealed about Microsoft's ambitions of what they want to do with gaming and they're quite wild. One crazy ambition by Microsoft written by Phil Spencer saying that he was written back in 2019 that Microsoft could spend Sony out of business. That's a big claim being like, yeah, we can take you out if we really wanted to, but we'll let you play. And Microsoft wanted to buy a lot more than they're really doing when it comes to the market share of available studios. They thought about buying studios from like Sega, Warner Brothers, Nexon, Supergiant Games, Niantic, 
Niantic, which are the people who work on Pokemon, Zynga, Bungie, and even Final Fantasy publisher Square Enix. Now, when Phil Spencer was asked to recall these emails, he's like, I don't quite remember those. This is, could be possibly just like thinking about it, not really actually activating on it, but seeing like what the possibilities were rather than being like, we want to do this and then it just didn't happen. But Microsoft and Xbox have always struggled to have an audience outside of the US. And that's where Sega comes in. Phil Spencer emailed the CEO of Microsoft, Satya Nadella, saying that we believe that Sega has built a well-balanced portfolio of games across segments with global geographic appeal and will help us accelerate Xbox Game Pass both on and off console. There were some major reveals when it comes to Call of Duty, specifically this year. Like this fall, it's gonna be pretty big for the franchise. One is that Call of Duty Warzone Mobile will be coming this fall, confirmed by Bobby Kotick. Not about the biggest bomb shell leak is that the judge actually leaked out that Call of Duty Modern Warfare 3 will release in November of 2023. Now this is consistent with all the rumors that we've heard about Modern Warfare 3 coming out this year. Originally it sounded like Modern Warfare 2 was going to be a two year cycle, which I was like, thank God, that sounds awesome. I'm actually really looking forward to it with the Call of Duty franchise. But then Activision's like, well, how about we just make Modern Warfare 3 instead? The rumor always was with Modern Warfare 2 for year two, that would be like a big expansion pack with basically like all the remastered maps from the classic day brought into Modern Warfare 2, but it seems like they might have modified that in a way to make it into Modern Warfare 3, which I mean, I'm all for that. The Modern Warfare series is the, my favorite series within Call of Duty. Though the funniest thing about this is that when that information was officially leaked out by the judge, the Call of Duty Twitter just tweeted out with eyeballs, just being like, uh, so we see this and uh, well, that kind of ruins the surprise to everybody. Like, not, it's not that it's not a surprise that there is gonna be a Call of Duty coming out at the end of this year. It's the fact that it's gonna be back to back of the same series, usually with the Call of Duty franchise, you do Modern Warfare, then Black Ops, then whatever Sledgehammer wants to do for whatever reason, and then you kind of repeat that cycle. We've never had like back-to-back -back games within the franchise. Well, it seems like we're doing it this time with Modern Warfare 3, which again, I'm happy about. Now for all you Bethesda, Zenimax fans who don't have an Xbox or a PC, you might be having some struggles moving forward, as it looks like in a 2021 meeting that Phil Spencer has seemingly decided to make all Zenimax games exclusive to the Xbox PC platform. Though oddly enough, when talking about Elder Scrolls 6 earlier in this court case, earlier in the week, Phil Spencer was like, we're not quite sure if we want to make the game exclusive and stuff like that. But it seems like moving forward that most likely that these Bethesda Zenimax games are gonna be platform exclusive. I mean, it kind of makes sense as they're mainly single player games. Mostly single player games are platform exclusive, minus like Halo, which is kind of in its own th situation right now that we won't talk about, which doesn't exactly help out Microsoft's case when against the FCC saying they want to make all their games exclusive. Though throughout all these other testimonies, it seems like the big one, like Call of Duty and any kind of multiplayer game that is already cross-platform, they'll most likely keep it that way as they just be more profitable to keep them that way. The funny thing I find within the entire article that was written about these last five days is that they didn't really talk about mobile games at all, which is way more profitable than any console game. You don't need $200 million to develop a mobile game. That's why publishers like King with Candy Crush have just made so much money on such simple games, but on the mobile game market, it just works. That wouldn't work on the console or PC side of things. So as someone who's paid close attention to the last five days of this court case, it seems like things are kind of in favor of this Xbox Activision Blizzard merger actually happening as the big people who are against it, say Sony, well, they were kind of have to be honest and be like, yeah, it's not anti-competitive. We'll be fine. We'll be more than fine, quoting them on that phrase. Though we're still waiting on the official statement from the judge when it comes to this court case, but I think things are gonna be going in favor of Xbox. And if that's the case, that means the only hurdle they have left are the cloud gaming services that UK has issues with, which is funny because Xbox admitted within this court case that xCloud is their least used service. If you wanna know some of the juicy details that came within day one and two, well, check out this video right here. Thank you much for watching. Catch you on the next one. Peace out.